The government is defaulting on its debt, not explicitly, but implicitly. They're def defaulting on their debt through inflation. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for April 15th through April 22nd, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce silver kangaroos at $3.19 over spot. We also have 2024 quarter ounce gold eagles at $69 over melt. And finally, we're offering 90% constitutional silver at just $2.75 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this widely followed returning guest. Michael Pento, the founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies, is an active money manager who looks at forward-facing indicators to determine how to keep his clients out of trouble in these turbulent times. He's here to give us that insight of his research. Michael, thank you for joining us this Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Mr. Kaiser. Well, we, we appreciate you giving us a heads up about directions that you see things heading long before we hear about them from officialdom, if we ever do. And uh, you've kept us on the right side of things several times in the past. We'd like your latest updates on the trends and the directions that you see uh, our financial world heading that people need to be aware of and that they're not hearing about on the mainstream financial press. Well, you know, when you, where do I start? Uh, I, want, I guess I want to start with this retail sales number that came out um, yesterday. You know, Wall Street, if you just listen to the CNBS and the other mainstream financial media outlets, they'll say, oh, retail sales increased by 1.1%. Um, on the core rate and even the um, control group up was, was up 1.1%. What they really almost never mention, or at least, you know, um, uh, uh, try to obfuscate is the fact that retail sales are in reported in nominal terms. So if you used a inflation number that was accurate, to deflate that nominal number, you probably would be in negative territory for retail sales. And why do I say that? There, there are 19 commodities in the CRB index, 19 commodities, and soft commodities, hard commodities, there's oil, there's all kinds of gas, there's gas and there's uh, wheat and corn, soybeans, gold, precious metals. That particular index was up 6% in the month of March, which I think is a pretty significant move. So does anybody believe that Real consumption was up by 1.1% for the month of March. No, it wasn't. So that's, this is why you need shows like this. This is why I come on the, your program. So, so the consumers are aware that the economy isn't that strong. What's happening is the rate of inflation is driving up interest rates, which is crushing the housing market. So housing starts were down 14.7% today. Pending sales were down about 6%. Uh, the real estate transaction market is frozen. The home price to income ratio is at a record high. When you add in mortgage costs and taxes and you know, homeowners association costs and insurance costs, they're completely out of reach of most Americans. And, and, and despite all of what I just said, oh, I forgot to mention that credit spreads are tight and becoming tighter, tighter. Uh, that financial conditions are easy and becoming easier. Uh, inflation has been above 2% for three years. Now, remember the Fed, remember we had this organization in, 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 um, in, 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 in created in 1913 was for, it was, it was for you, the consumer. They just wanted to provide stable prices and a nice smooth economy. How are they doing on that, on that, uh, on that goal? So we've had collapses every few years. The economies are collapsed, you know, 2000, 2008, 2019, 2020, 2022. The markets collapse. How prices collapsed by 33% in 2008. You have runaway inflation, 9%, the way they calculate it, really 20% in reality. But then they redefine stable prices from, uh, 0% inflation, that's stable prices. Now it's 2%. And now they've, they're above 2% for three 
days? No. Three weeks? No. Three months? No. Three quarters? No. Three years, they're above 2%. The rate of inflation went from 3.2 to 3.5%. So it's, it's rising on a rate of change basis faster away from their 2% target. And they're still talking about cutting rates and ending, ending quantitative tightening. Wow. I mean, that, that should really make you angry. Yeah. And as you've pointed out, Michael, the, we've spoken with John Williams from shadowstats.com. And as, as you talk about these headline AQ, uh, these CPI numbers, such as, uh, 3.5% being gosh awful, which it is. Uh, but in the light of the fact that they've changed the way that they measure it, to make it artificially appear lower for a good headline number, which by the way, as you've pointed us out to us in the past also means they're understating the cost of living adjustments for social security recipients, et cetera. It's hurting every earner, every saver, every retiree. So, the, and it's much worse than what we're being told. So yeah, we're being told even what you described, even what's coming out of their mouths doesn't make sense that, that missing their target on an accelerating basis is uh, not, uh, stable price, you know, uh, management. But the fact is that even the numbers that they're using to, that they're missing, uh, are, are cooked books and, and they're not even telling us the true story. Do you have a closer handle on what the true inflation rate would be if it were being stated honestly? Well, I think it's come down from around 20% to maybe eight or 9%, the way I calculate it. In reality, you know, the Wall Street Journal did a study and they said in, in the last four years that food prices are up 36 percent. 36 percent in the last four years. And, and for people like me, and I'm sure you, I mean, we don't spend a tremendous amount of percentage of our income on food and clothing and shelter. But isn't the Federal Reserve purportedly for the middle class, they're for the poor, right? That's what they're there for. They want stable prices and full employment. They're, they're there for you, right? Their, their goal should be, done again, their goal should be deflation, not disinflation, not reflation, not intractable inflation. Their goal should be deflation. According to my calculations, Home prices and stock prices are 40%. Have to, I'm going to be accurate. They have to fall by 40% just to bring them back to historical normal, normal ranges. Uh, home price to income ratios and total market cap of equities as a percentage of the economy. Fall 40%. Now, that leads me to the truth. Why? Why do you think power? Don't, don't you wish, don't you wish, don't again, you could ask the Chair Powell, a question in one of these meetings. I, I mean, I, I would say, Mr. Powell, does it bother you that first time home buyers can't buy a house? It, it, does it bother you that home, food prices are up, you know, by a third in the last four years since you engaged in monetizing Janet Yellen's, uh, you know, helicopter money? It, 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 does that bother you at all? Isn't the real reason why you want to cut rates in this environment when when you're moving further and further away from your goal, isn't the real issue that banks hold commercial mortgage-backed securities? Banks hold residential mortgage-backed securities. Banks own treasuries. And aren't all of those asset prices plunging because of your desire to raise interest rates? You're, you're well-founded, although in vain to this point, trying to reduce the rate of inflation back to where it, you know, to back to zero where it should be. But really, like I started saying, it should actually be a, a desire to bring deflation for a while just to get these asset bubbles under control and to bring home prices back to a place that can be supported by the free market. That would make the most sense. Now, corporations have to refinance $1.8 trillion of debt. By the end of 2025, their, their refinancing costs are up 45%. So, uh, uh, so the government is paying 
one trillion dollars of in, an interest payments in 2025. So those are the reasons why the Fed is saying, mm, no, there's no inflation. At work, work, it's blumpy, it's chumpy, it's loppy, blah, blah, blah. blah. I mean, no, <laughs> you're protecting banks. You're protecting the government. That's first and foremost, and corporations. That's who you have in mind when you say you, you're going you're gonna to cut rates and end quantitative tightening. You're going to reduce it by half very, very soon. Because you're panicked to try to keep asset bubbles afloat. It reminds me of the scene from the Titanic where the damage has already been done to the ship. The ship is going down and yet the word doesn't get out. And there's the idea to avoid a panic and, and keep things a little bit quiet for a while. It's as though the Fed intentionally goes up there and makes whatever speeches they make and uses whatever verbiage, verbiage they use to try to calm and smooth everybody's feathers, uh, rather than saying, this is serious. These are serious times. We have to take serious actions in order to actually fulfill our mandate. Or guys, it's not going to be possible to fulfill our mandate because we, we box ourselves into a corner and, and we're at the end game. So, the, the, so Jerome Powell is doing his impression of Baghdad Bob. If you remember the, like, oh yeah, we're winning. You're, you know, we're winning the war. Everything's great. Um, uh, so, um, it would be it would be a it would be a stretch to just to ask these people who are, who have made themselves demigods like oh, I know the direction of the economy and I know exactly what the cost of money should be at all times me and the twelve members of the Federal Open Market Committee you know well there's twelve voting members it's fifteen members altogether now why Dunning you're a religious guy I I, I am I like to think I've read the Bible. And have gone to uh, church most of my adult life. Um, how many apostles were there? That's 12. 12. Is, is it just by coincidence there's 12 voting members, of 12 regional banks? I mean, these people want to portray that they're, they're omniscient. They're demigods. And they know better than the free market. But in reality, what they really are are politicians. They're politicians. And, and, and what politician wants to get up and say, we need deflation and we need a depression for a few years just to reconcile all the imbalances that we have created since really 1987 when we went on this wild idea, this, this idea that we have a tool, 71, we, we broke the, the gold window, 87, we printed a tremendous amount of money to bail out the, the stock market. And we continue this philosophy because we had the hubris to believe that we don't need a bear market in stocks. That's bad. Done again. Why would you want a bear market? And why would you want a recession to clear out all the, you know, light a fire and burn out all the dead brush so you wouldn't have a, 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 a conflagration that would burn down the whole woods? You don't want, you don't want recessions. You don't want bear markets in stocks, do you? Well, we have a tool. We have this, we could just print money we, unfettered without any backing. It's meaningless. It's fiat 100% by decree. So, um, what happens when you do that over and over again, eventually you create massive asset bubbles and you encourage a tremendous amount of debt via interest rate suppression. That's where we are right now. We, listen, there's a record $1.3 trillion of credit card debt. Delinquencies are up 59% year over year. It's the highest since 2011. Corporate debt has surged to 115%, up 115% since 2007. Household debt, done again is up to $20 trillion. People say, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, the household's deleveraged. No, no, they have. Oh, they're sitting on massive amounts of cash. Well, most of that gets true. Most of that cash is, in aggregate they are, most of that cash is in the upper uh, quintile. Um, but they also have a record amount of debt. And that's up from $15.6 trillion in 2019. So there's no de there's been no deleveraging like there's no debt outstanding. There's a tremendous amount of debt outstanding, and asset bubbles have never been uh, more egregiously priced or valued as a percentage of incomes in the economy. But then again, there's a reason why 78 percent of Americans 78 percent of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And do you care about that, Jerome? Yeah, that's one of the things that I think you just touched on in a couple points there is that the the prosperity 
uh, illusion that's been fostered by the zero interest rate policy or, ne or negative interest rate policy, real interest rates, uh, in, in order to keep the stock markets buoyed up and to keep the banks solvent, uh, has benefited not just the top quintile, but the top 1% of the top 1% of 1%. There's the, that's been a huge, uh, shift in wealth that hasn't, is not new in history, but it's been accelerating. Could you address that as how these, this, um, puppet show is saying, oh, we're here, we're, we're filling our mandate to, for the people. Whereas when we're lying through our teeth to the people, while we're lining the pockets of the very, very, very uh, highest financial elite and keeping the bank solvent. Well, that's a direct consequence of trying to keep the bank solvent. I mean, when, you're, when your goal is, you know, why, is the, why was the Fed created? It was, it was the banker's bank. So there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lender of last resort for the banking system. And when you engage in chronic interest rate repression, that is what you get. You get asset bubbles and you get insolvency. And now we have, now we've rendered the U.S. government insolvent. You have, well, 125, 130 percent debt to GDP. And I'm not talking about unfunded liabilities here. I'm talking about the promises we've already made to the current Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security system, plus the private, uh, the publicly held debt. You can't grow an economy any longer when you have that kind of debt. You, you know, you have a situation now when you already have a government that's insolvent. And then on the next next recession, you're going to have deficits usually triple in recessions. So the deficit is going to go from $2 trillion to $6 trillion. Who's going to buy it, Dunnigan? That, that's why the Fed is panicked to get interest rates down. But here's a little secret for them that maybe they're not aware of. They do control money market rates. They control the overnight interbank lending rate for sure. And they can control the rate on T-bills for sure. But do they control long-term interest rates? Long-term interest rates are a function of debt supply issuance, you know, the insolvency or the solvency state of the sovereign, the credit rating of the sovereign, and inflation. That's what they're a function of. And how do we count on those scores? I, 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 I think that the surprise is going to be, and it's a real, it's not, it's not a fat tail risk. It, it's a, it's a very, it's almost, I don't say guaranteed. It's a very high percent chance that when the Fed cuts interest rates, the yield curve uninverts, long-term rates soar higher. And, is that going to be a, um, how is that going to ameliorate the housing market? Is that going to be a big fix? I mean, normally the way fi the Fed fixes things, at least temporarily, when they say put their head in the sand, how do they fix things? Well, they lower interest rates, print up a bunch of money and take the whole interest rate complex down, the whole curve down. So short-term rates fall much faster than long-term rates, but borrowing costs ease. And the amount of debt outstanding is not as, you know, as, as pernicious as it once was. But that's not going to happen this time because we, we've already inculcated to the, to the globe that the Fed doesn't care about the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, not against the euro, the yen, the pound, against hard assets, against gold and silver and oil, real estate, even the, the horrific Bitcoin, which I'll, I, I probably will never own. <laughs> I eschew that. I reject that on moral grounds. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I'd much rather own a, a real, a real, a real element, uh, a very rare element, very beautiful element, a virtually indestructible element than a bunch of letters and numbers that exist on a, uh, you know, in the in the netherworld. Which brings us to the topic of positions that it sounds very bleak. Uh, the the corner that the financial edifice has backed into through all these decades of not allowing natural uh, forces to and, and free markets, so that that leaves people who want to take prudent and forward looking action to position themselves for the least harm in this environment. Since we live in this, we don't live in the Garden of Eden. We live in this in this world, and we have those who are in charge of our financial 
lives, uh, at least from a policy standpoint, have the best interests of the banks, et, et cetera, at heart rather than the best interests of the ordinary people. So uh, what steps are you seeing? For example, is this a time when you see that people owning gold and other hard assets is, is a way of protecting themselves against uh, the uh, destructive effects of these policies or, or uh, policy options, none, none of which look very appealing, uh, might be coming? Well, um, normally, I, so I, I'm asking myself this question. Well, I own gold. I'm, a, I'm about 12% owner of uh, physical gold outside of what you have in your own possession. This is, this is what I call, I call liquid paper gold. What do I own? So I own physical gold ETFs and I own gold mining ETFs. And the, to, the sum of those equate to about 12%. I, I'll go as high as 20% in my portfolio. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm over halfway there. Um, but why is gold, I'm asking, why, why is gold doing so well when the dollar is rising and interest rates are rising? Normally those things would be very, very detrimental for gold. And of course you have the, you know, geopolitical strife. Um, you have, I guess, the, the threat of World War III um, with Iran attacking Israel in retaliation for their uh Embassy being attacked in Syria. Attacked in Syria. Um, you also have this constant tailwind from central banks, which are saying, you know, I have these currency reserves. I usually park them in U.S. dollars, which are really in U.S. treasuries, right? But then I'm, I, I subject myself to sanctions and confiscations, which has happened uh, in the past. So why would I do that? I'd much rather have physical possession of gold. And that's where I want my currency reserves. I don't want them in U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries. There's that tailwind. But I think what, that, what else is happening here is that this is one of those rare situations where nominal rates are rising. And you would think the Fed with inflation and you would think the Fed would be like, hey, we have to fight this. We have to raise interest rates. But this is one of those rare times in history where you see it's clear to everybody other than the men, men, mendacious 12 that sit on the, the voting me, the members of the FOMC, um, you should be hiking rates here, but you're not. You're actually preparing to ease monetary policy, which in, in, my, mean, in, in my mind means that while nominal rates would rise, inflation is going to rise along with it. So you're not getting a rise in real interest rates. You're getting a stasis or a, a fall in real interest rates. Um, and that has always been rocket fuel for gold. That coupled with the, the idea that the U.S. government is now completely insolvent, um, not bankrupt, insolvent. They're different. They're two different terms. They mean different things. Um, but their assets minus, minus their liabilities are negative. Uh, and there's nothing they can do about, do, nothing they can adequately do about it without bankrupting the financial system. That's, that's what I, that's why I think gold is sniffing out and to a lesser extent silver too. And as you look forward, uh, you've been concerned about uh, credit liquidity crises emerging with uh, these banks, so many banks holding bonds that are underwater and uh, so many uh, commercial real estate loans needing to get refinanced at higher rates from companies that are, by the way, already zombie companies. And some, you'll tell us how many, what percentage of them. Uh, what are your, what's your current outlook on this looming uh, pinch point in terms of liquidity affecting both the, and, and solvency, frankly, affecting the banks uh, and companies out there and how that is likely or not likely to emerge in the next uh, period of time here. Well, 30% of banks' assets are, are in uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities. Um, 1.5 trillion in commercial real estate loans are coming due in the next two years. Um, listen, the reverse repo facility right now is $300, $310 billion. I just checked it this morning. It's in the low $300 billion. It was $2.5 trillion. That is where all of the liquidity is coming from. It's, it's leaving the Fed's balance sheet and coming into buying treasury, the treasury complex. And that's given, you know, that, that's, that is in, in, in essence, not, not just offsetting quantitative tightening, but it's adding liquidity into the system by about a, a half a trillion dollars. Now, that facility should run dry around, around June. 
I, I originally thought March, but I, the, the rate of the, the, the it was not a linear, uh, uh, you know, regression. So I'm going to say it's probably, like I said, June or maybe July the latest. When that ends, you're going to have the Fed cannot cut rates while inflation is this high. I think I think we might have one rate cut later this year, maybe after the election. That's my best guess. It, they just can't do it right now. And the Fed's not ending QT. They're just cutting it in half, probably starting May. In, in May. Banks are tightening lending standards and you have the reverse repo facility running dry. I, I still think there's a salient risk that we could have a liquidity crisis in the summer. Because you know, even if the Fed were to cut once, you know, the, the range is five and a quarter, five and a half on the Fed funds rate. They go to five to five and a quarter. It really isn't that big of a deal. So what I'm saying, unless the Fed aggressively cuts rates, and, and and if they and if they did that, what would happen to long term interest rates? Like I, I just talked about before, it might not solve anything. It might create a whole set of problems that make make the, the mortgage back mortgage backed securities and treasuries on their balance sheets of banks even worse. So um, we're not out of the, we're not out of the woods here just because the Fed is talking about easing monetary policy. Um, I'll ha I have a model and I have. Uh, a work ethic. I'm here every day working. So I will monitor the situation carefully. Um, we're in a situation where I predicted we would have inflation coming out of helicopter money. That was an obvious pick. I'm not the only one who did that. I then correctly predict that we'd have a, a long period of disinflation. We've had that. We've been in a period of reflation for the past few months and we're invested accordingly, which is in sectors three and four of my investment spectrum. So we're not short the market here. We're enjoying the ride, rise in gold and the rise in stock prices. Um, but there's a good chance in that summer time frame we could have a liquidity crisis. And that could be a big problem for the stock market and the bond market as well. For people who want to take advantage of your services as an active money manager, how would they do so? So the website is pentoport.com. And on it, you'll see a midweek reality check. Uh, it's fifty dollars a year if you want to pay for that uh, thirty-six thousand foot analysis of the real economic data that you need to understand. And um, if you have a hundred thousand dollars to invest and you're a U.S. citizen, I will manage your money directly using the inflation deflation and economic cycle model. Uh, by the way, that trial there's a five-week free trial for the midweek reality check. I like to call it the midweek sanity check because there's a lot of craziness going on in our world and in the in the I would say negligent uh, reporting of it by the mainstream financial press. Negligence. That's why people. That's why shows like yours are so popular. I mean, if you listen to the mainstream financial media, it's like, hey, the economy's great, the consumer's great. There are no asset bubbles out there. Um, everything has been deleveraged. Uh, the only problem we have in leverage is with the government. And who cares if the government is insolvent? They can always just print money. Inflation is coming back down to 2%. No problem. It's going to be lumpy, but you know it'll get there. Uh, and there's no problem. That's If you listen, I listen to it. I have it on the background while, while I'm working. Uh, if you believe that, your, your retirement plans are going, to, are, are going to get scuttled. That's one of the greatest concerns I have is how ordinary – mom and pops across the country are going to be hurt by this. They've worked hard their whole lives. They've saved diligently. Uh, they're trying to do the right thing for themselves and for their family, and they're going to get hurt uh, if they don't take a uh, defensive or protective posture that's, that's actually reflective of the truth that we're facing. The other thing that that also omits is that we're not, all these talking heads aren't fooling foreign holders of U.S. treasuries and the and the dollar and they're seeing the dollar weaponized against them and they're seeing their treasuries uh having less and less chance of ever being repaid long term so any comments you have about those who are not being fooled in addition to those who are likely to be hurt yeah i made a great point i mean you're you're the government is defaulting on its debt not explicitly but implicitly they're def defaulting on that debt through inflation and you know the 60 40 portfolio done again since the end of 21 is down about 15% you know that means if you're if you're you know you're looking at 
the vast majority of these target date funds will say, you know, you're 50 years old, you should have about 50% stocks, 50% bonds. And they don't tell you where to invest on the yield curve. I mean, we've invested 100% on the short term, getting that rich yield without any, without really any, hardly any duration risk at all. We're in one to three year treasuries uh, and, and cash. So uh, mostly one to three year treasuries. But if you're if you're in the 6040 portfolio and you have duration in your in your portfolio, you're down about 40, 50 percent in your portfolio in the past few years. That's a lot of money. That is a crash of unprecedented proportions with half of your money for retirement in safe US treasuries. Uh so if you're not, you know, if people here, oh, NVIDIA, if you're in the, if you're in the A, if you're a hundred percent of your retirement is in the AI stocks, well, God bless you. I mean, <laughs> not a very prudent, uh, and safe mix, but you, you're doing fine right now. Or at least you were up until if you own the Magnificent Seven and now it's the Magnificent Four, I think. Um, you're doing fine. You're doing okay. But what, what portfolio doesn't have this ability and the ballast? Of bonds in it. That's what that's what most people have. But where I I'm a fiduciary, I have that too. But it's just the intelligence and the foresight to say, wait a second, in a in a in a context of insolvency and reflation, you do not want to own long duration treasuries. You, you saved yourself a ton of money by just making that simple calculation. And what stocks do you want to own? Do you want to do you want to be in aggressive stocks during hyperinflation, or do you want to be you know overextended in bonds in hyperinflation or in tractable inflation? There's a risk that's eventually going to happen. Or do you want to have uh, Bitcoin and Nvidia during a deflationary depression, which is what this country really needs to reconcile all of the imbalances? So it's just think it's just thought the, the model tells me where to be on that spectrum. Of the, in, between deflation and intractable inflation, and knowing what asset classes and style factors to own at, at different times could save you a lot of money. See, the big thing you have to understand is don't overweight bonds in, like I just said, insolvency and in inflation, and don't be stuck in a portfolio, a fixed portfolio of equities during recessions and, re, and de deflations. So it's, it, it sounds simple. It's very difficult to achieve, but if you can do that, you'll be okay. Rather than, you know, buying um, the Nikkei Dow in 1989 or the Shanghai Composite in 2007, which is, which is what I think you could be doing, going massively long stocks right now. And uh, just to remind people who haven't been following the scores on home, those markets uh, haven't recovered their previous highs for decades. Well, well, Shanghai just... Shanghai is down, I think, about 40, 50 percent. Uh, Nikkei Dow is just about broken even last time I checked, you know, <laughs> after decades, you know, decades. Well, Michael, we always appreciate your presence here with us on Liberty and Finance, keeping us uh, on the right side of things and aware of what's going on, because we're not going to hear about this on the mainstream financial press, as you've made so abundantly clear. And we're just grateful on behalf of all of our viewers and subscribers, I thank you for joining us on Liberty and Finance. Thank you, Dylan. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for April 15th through April 22nd, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature backdated one ounce silver kangaroos at $3.19 over spot. We also have 2024 quarter ounce gold eagles at $69 over melt. And finally, we're offering 90% constitutional silver at just $2.75 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.